Hey everyone and welcome back to the Firefighters Podcast where we seek to develop, inspire and motivate the world of the emergency services operator through a series of wide-ranging conversations. Now before we go any further, just hit that rate, follow or subscribe button on whatever platform you're listening to. It's a key performance indicator for us and helps us reach even more people. Now here's what we've got for you today. My guest today is Amy Croxton Evans. Amy is a station manager at North Wales Fire and Rescue Service and has spent over two decades working in the sector. We cover a whole host of ground today, and I want you to look out for a few specific things. There's so much in here about culture. We touch on the gender bias as we hunt our way through some of Sabrina Cohen Hatton's most recent stuff. We talk a lot about authentic leadership. Amy shows some tremendous humility in this, some real honesty, honestly, a lot of uh, vulnerability as well. That authenticity factor is something that really comes through really strong in this. It's really interesting to hear about Amy's first interactions in the service and also as she progressed through some of the personal aspects. We talk about how society reacts to women as firefighters because she joined at 19 with a one-year-old daughter and that really built a lot of resiliency and she had to go through some struggles. Now, this is by no means a victim mentality when we talk about this, but there is aspects of imposter syndrome in there. The value of mentors and the support she's taken from a lot of people in the service and connections through things like Women in the Fire Service, where myself and Amy first met. Amy's worked her way through quite a few ranks in the Fire and Rescue Service, and we talk a little bit about that. We talk about emotional intelligence, building rapport, how you build and grow confidence in others, and also, we close with some aspects around feeling safe to fail, you know, creating environments where we can learn from mistakes and not be fearful of making decisions. Be sure to jump into the notes. You can find a link to Amy. You can find her on LinkedIn. There is a link in there for that. Please be sure to check out our sponsors and partners in the links as well. And once again, thanks for coming back to the podcast. If you want to continue to support us, you can jump over to Patreon. You will only find... 200 episodes out there for the firefighters podcast because the rest of them are in our archives with the rest of the episodes and a whole host of sector data books articles manifestos all sorts of stuff that gets sent by all of our guests click in the links of the notes and for just three pound a month you can support the future of the podcast but without further ado please welcome amy croxton evans amy it's Really, really great to, to welcome you to the podcast. And before we came on, and where I'd love for us to start today is we were kind of talking about little adventures in our own lives and about what our partners do. And we were both reflecting on a recent book that we both read. And, I, and I'll leave it to you to introduce it. But I suppose the kickoff of what would be the introduction to that is this whole aspect in that book where two people working as first responders do a very similar job, similar to what you and your partner do. Yeah. <laughs> and they're going in and they're, they're, they're meeting friends or they're going into a business or they're at a party and they tell people what they're doing for a living and they are met with totally different responses. One being like, and, and I know you, you had this exact thing with your partner as a police officer. One thinks, oh, that's amazing. You're so brave. And all these stereotypes that we associate with that. And the other person, perhaps yourself in this analogy, gets that aspect of, oh my God, aren't you scared? Isn't that dangerous? So with that as our kickoff, please give us an idea of like your recent interpretation with that and, and kind of where this comes from, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, that's br um, brilliant. Um, so yeah, I'm Amy Croxton Evans. I'm um, from North Wales Fire and Rescue Service, currently a station manager. And yeah, that that analogy um, and that book I recently read by Sabrina Cohen Hatton and um, it's the gender bias. That example there, oh, it so resonates with myself. Um, I've been in the service for um, 16 years. Um, and throughout it's it's been a similar sort of story in regards to that exact thing so we myself and my husband went to uh, a bank recently and we had to put down our occupations um and interestingly enough I mean I don't I, I kind of expect it now but um we went to the bank um they asked for his occupation and I mean they, they still talk to him um as he, like the grown-up in the conversation in the meeting <laughs> <laughs> um, and I've sat there just uh, as a as a watcher, um, and yeah, they ask for his occupation. He says police officer, and they they you know sh short a small talk in regards to how he's so brave and wow, where do you where do you police? And mm. he'll talk about the area and oh, it must Thank be you rough for and, you and all that jazz. Yeah, there. yeah, but it's almost like oh, it must be so rough and oh, you must you know you uh, you must be so brave doing that and. Um, and he's, you know, he kind of plays it down because, it, you know, it, it's modest. Um, and then it gets to myself and I say, OK, well, your occupation, I say firefighter. Um, 
And then the response I get is similar to what uh, Sabrina mentioned in regards to, oh my gosh, um, you're not get scared. What? So you're an actual firefighter. Like answer the phones, firefighter. And no, no, I'm an actual firefighter. Um, so do you do you go inside the buildings that are on fire? You don't go in the fires. You don't put ladders up unless you know. Sometimes a joke and say, no, no, I'm the I'm a firefighter that stands outside. Um, I don't actually. Do well, that's the thing because you're almost part of you <laughs> wants to go. Actually, I'm a station manager, but then you're yeah, also uh, you're not trying to say like ego. You don't want to scream, yeah. but you're also like. I've I've done that bit for flipping ten years or whatever. Yeah, I know. I'm and warning the fires, but then the, the conversation almost flips straight to the partner, where it's like, "Yo, oh my god, you let her do that," or you know, yeah. "Are you worried about her?" But they don't yeah. say, you know, "Are you worried about your husband? Are you worried about him getting hurt?" Or what? What yeah. if other people treat him a certain way at a station? And it's weird. Yeah, it's so bizarre. I mean, we've had we've we've had every evaluate every sort of conversation there is to have from different people putting their opinions and the curiosity that's great that's fine and I really encourage curiosity because that might inspire someone to sort of give something a go that they wouldn't have considered before but um it just it amazes me that society still has this bias that um gosh you know your, your children what do your children think oh my gosh it's not it's so dangerous like as if I'm I'm willing to sacrifice being a mother but yet they don't see that with him they don't think well you you're doing just as dangerous a job maybe even worse um, you know, you're putting your fact that you're a father on the line, so it's mm. bizarre, isn't it? But um, I think yeah, there's really so many strange angles to to that thing as well, because the the mother aspect is something I'd I'd, I'd love to to get your thoughts on, because there's two kind of threads to it. There's like there's the girl boss culture, which is great and empowering women and all that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. And I always say there's no solutions to things like sexism and things like that. There's only trade offs, and what I mean by that is whilst we've empowered women and it's wonderful and all that jazz and it always should have been the case to start with it does come with a change to culture because then what i think sometimes gets vilified is the women that do want to stay home and and be a stay-at-home mom and be a be a full-time parent and then the the other side of that is some women that have thought well we've fought so long for all this pay gender gap and rights and blah 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 and you should be out there doing it and then they almost view the mum who wants to just be a mum, just be a mum is even a horrible term, as like they've failed. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Why can't why can't we all just like appreciate what people yeah. want? If you want a career and you don't want kids, fantastic. But if actually yeah. your dream has always been to have a family, that's fantastic as well, because that's at the heart yeah. of our entire society, isn't it? Like great. Yeah, family. absolutely. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Gore-Tex Professional Fabrics. Now, we all know the working environment of a firefighter is filled with challenges. We face serious risks on the job, such as heat exhaustion, burns, physical and mental stress, and we frequently come into contact with high levels of toxic chemicals. Now, I have been wearing Gore-Tex for nearly two decades on the front line, working in hostile environments, tackling challenging incidents from firefighting to water incidents and in urban search and rescue environments. Gore-Tex have a well-earned reputation for protecting professionals in the fire and emergency services through their family of highly innovative waterproof breathable moisture barriers that exceeds global performance standards and are trusted worldwide gore-tex going further together there's another part of sabrina's book which talks about something like what you mentioned in there and it's incredible like when you actually sit and reflect because we've we've again myself and husband have been through this because i joined the service at 19 um and um had my daughter uh, I'd had my daughter at 18. Um, so I joined the service with a baby and it changed our lives. But my husband had to give up his job to become a stay-at-home father. And um, Sabrina talks in her book We had about, to, and he um, chose to. Or he had to. Because I'm, I'm not being a picky bugger there, but it's like, he didn't ha- He didn't have to. Well, he did he? wanted to, to support his family. <laughs> yeah, he, yeah, he chose to. I mean, if it, we it's just a strange thing in our vernacular, isn't it? When people say, I had to do this, it's almost like, oh, my children yeah. have been a cost. You know yeah, I mean? yeah, it's, it's yeah, no, good point, like, yeah. It just slips into our vernacular accidentally, I think, sometimes, because yeah. it's what people say, isn't it? For it, for for me to to start my career as a firefighter, the only option I had would be for my husband to give up his job and support me that way, because there wasn't another option. We didn't have family in the position to do that. There's no childcare arrangements that could ever, whilst I was working away, because um, the, the station I was at meant I had to live away, um, there wasn't another option. So it was, you know, without that support, I at that time, I wouldn't have been able to do it. So he took up that mantle. And um, and what I was referring to, 
Yeah, I and, and I don't and think I'd have been man enough, brave enough, because it's such a sacrifice. And sorry, I don't want to get down the rabbit hole of your partner, but I don't want to not acknowledge it as well because it's like that's such a huge thing to do mm -hmm. because it's part almost yeah. of the death of an identity for men to think like, yeah. oh God, what are what are my friends going to think of me? What's everybody going to say? Yeah. You know, and we, uh, you know, I'm just a stay at home dad. Is that even a thing? Yeah. I think that's incredible that he did that. Yeah, it was. It was. Yeah, really. Um, you know, and forever my career will be. Um, it wouldn't have been where I am. I wouldn't have. You know, it wouldn't have lasted a a day if I hadn't had that support. So, um, but the yeah, what I was getting to with regards to what um Sabrina spoke about was her husband had to do something similar. So while she was working, her husband had to give up. Um, not had to, chose to give up his um work to take um their children to I think it was like a children's play or crash or, yes. or swimming God, swimming lessons. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah yeah and then he was he went there and she was when she went and took the children she was greeted by you know the the talk the mum's talk and um comparing stories um and it's really friendly when the husband went um he was not spoken to he was sort of left alone he was in the corner with the little one by herself I had that exact same thing. I remember taking my Crazy, daughter to isn't her it? first swimming class, right? And I was, this was a, like a bit of a dark time in my life. I was a strong man, competitive strong man at the time. So imagine this, six foot five, bold, white guy, 24 <laughs> stone, just sheer muscle, clearly taking too many <laughs> drugs with some tiny little baby girl. And I'm bouncing around in a circle in, a, in, in the baby pool, singing wheels yeah. on the bus. And I felt... <laughs> I genuinely, like afterwards, when I was in the change rooms with her by myself, trying to figure it all yeah. out, I yeah. actually got quite tearful. I was really upset because oh. I felt like she had less of an enjoyable time because I was oh. there with her. That's horrible, isn't it? He didn't get as much out of the session because the mum wasn't it's fucking making me upset now. Sorry. Oh, isn't um, that? And that's so sad though because I think I I think like just the three. So just talking about yourself, me, and Sabrina, we've all been through this type of gender bias in both both sides. I think it's so. I'm not just when I talk about gender bias and I think about it, I'm not just thinking about the women. You know, it's it's the other side of it, and I think it's really important that our children, kind of where we can, we can try and reduce that, eliminate it. I don't. It's going to take forever, isn't it? But it's hmm. so important that we. Um, at least have these conversations and yeah. try and think about our actions you know if you if I was the mother in that group that you attended would I have been a bit like oh gosh you know oh, as a dad I don't want to go and approach and feel like you know am I chatting him up you know if, if you I don't know what the perception is I don't know what's I don't know why people do that why is it so standoffish why are we so primate with regards to because you might get it in a bar you're like oh well yeah. i don't I want that man approaching me or i won't approach him because there's other fears in yeah. place there's another um have you read a book called what about men no uh, oh honestly right i would strongly encourage yeah. i'll send yeah. it to you afterwards it's by oh, well, um, yeah. caitlin uh, caitlin moran who's actually written she written two books before that because she's got two daughters about um women and, and stereotypes and young girls and challenges and life chapters yeah. and all this the physiological and the mental and then a lot of the stage shows that you're, she went around and people would ask her or the common question that kept coming up was i loved it blah 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 but i've got a 15 year old son and yeah. i'm really struggling with him you know he's, he's so quiet he's very much not like my daughter I'm struggling mm. to connect with him and I'm struggling and and it's such a powerful book. Mm. I'll, I'll I'll send it to you. I'll put that it in the link good, for this yeah. um for this episode as well. But it's so true because it happens on both sides of the coin mm. and I'm not, and I don't for one second think we should back off the pedal of uh, of things like WFS and some of the incredible work that that's happened mm. to empower women. But it is important to recognize that uh no one's no it's one's on innocent in this. Do you know what I mean? Yes, yeah, so yeah, it's, it's on both absolutely. sides. Absolutely. I think until we really do approach it from both sides we won't get the buy-in from everyone because yeah it's you know it, you, men and women both feel this at different aspects different times in their life so it's if we don't um don't try to acknowledge that and be honest and really reflect then um opportunities like like the ones we just spoke about are always gonna occur um and yeah the people that lose out are the, are the children usually isn't it and the parents then yeah because it's so hilarious when you look at actually children there's a great um there's a great segue from a study that I was reading a long time ago where there was a couple and they were traveling around trying to understand cultural differences and they were visiting tribes and visiting all these people across the world. Um, I remember that I can't remember the people's names. I apologize. But um, 
every place they would go, they'd spend like the first day or whatever trying to speak to the elders of the tribe and understand mm. cultural barriers and how to be polite and etiquette and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, in the first three minutes, because they did this whole thing with their kids as well. They did the traveling with yeah. kids. First three minutes, guess what the kids are doing? No idea. Playing together. <laughs> oh, oh, all the kids. Just straight oh, away. Really, yeah. Their kids and the kids of the, the tribe they were visited straight away within no three difference. minutes are just playing Definitely. they're just running around chasing oh, stuff so or hitting lovely. things with sticks and you're like guys yeah. and girls it's not this complicated yeah. let's not let's, yeah, let's and reference you know, it and it's true and the stats and everything is right but let's not get bogged down yeah, in the quagmire yeah. otherwise Politics. you create a culture <laughs> of fear yeah where absolutely. people aren't doing stuff because it's the right thing to do people are doing stuff because they're scared of yeah. being accused of not doing it right and then you get yeah. a whole like weird values yeah. like mix politics, going on don't isn't you? It? and i think um there was another there was another bit again i know sabrina's going to be she's going to need to have to pay me for all the things <laughs> <I'm>... <laughs> re- re- represent but this is i really i you know i loved it it was really good um but there's another bit in her book which talks about sort of with, so if you if you i've got a boy and a girl and it says that if you they did a research they did some research in regards to um mothers and fathers of boys and girls um and they they um Oh, I can't remember what they did. They did. They put like a, a slide in a room or something like this. And they put a slide in the room and then they um, they just left a group of girls and to see what they did. And when the girls went to have a little look, start climbing it, the mothers would run over and go, oh, be careful, get down, get down, be careful, yeah. don't climb. And I can't remember if it was a tree or a slide or something. Don't do that, don't do that. Um, when the boys were in the room, the the mothers were like, go and play, go on, get up there. And yeah. and if, they, if the girls fell over, they were like, they kind of like, pampered to them a little more and sort of oh come on let's have cuddles and blah blah, blah. with the boys who were like get up get up you know you got this it's okay go on so I think you know from 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 that research she did uh, it's incredible because you think it's so true like girls have been taught from a very young age to be risk averse to to be careful be safe keep yourselves like keep yourself like in a safe place don't put yourself out there don't fail don't don't make a mistake don't hurt yourself boys go for it try go and have a go get rough and tumble um and it was um again i haven't done it justice talking about the research because it's incredible no, it's a whole have, chapter, you have. and there's a but, great one yeah. as well where they say um i forget who it is but they say would well, you, you want your kids to be safe or do you want them to be resilient yeah, people's yeah. immediate instinct is to go safe well actually yeah. the safest kid is the one you just keep in, yeah. in the corner and just feed it and give it water every couple of hours and never let yeah. it leave that room. Not happy. Yeah. It's not happy. It's not fulfilled. Yeah. You know, you want it to be resilient and you can't protect people yeah. from, from everything. And also along the vein of like um, male toxicity, but it relates to what you're saying there. I was reading a really scary statistic around the profiles of child molesters and grooming techniques. This was not oh, like yeah. for me to get tips, but I yeah. saw it the other day <laughs> and it was an interview with somebody from a, it was a police officer or an investigator of whatever the terminology is investigating someone that had been incarcerated for being a child molester and groomer. And they said, yeah. what, what do you look for in a victim? Because they were trying to get profiles and trying to help identify more yeah. groupers and people like that. And they said, if the person hasn't got a strong male role model in their life, wow. that is a key thing that they look for. Because there's a vacuum there. There's an absence. Mm-hmm. And that's yeah. what also makes me worry when you see this toxic masculinity tribe going out and bashing anybody. Because yeah. if we, if if I, mm. if they said, tell me about Amy. And I said, oh, Amy's strong. She's independent. She, she's really driven. She's really empathetic. Yeah. But you know what? She's a real, she's a kick ass. She's a real go getter. She, she gets shit done. Do you know what I mean? If I said that, they go, oh, yeah, 100% yeah. you go, girl. They'd be high fiving you and putting whatever in the yeah. Instagram profiles. But if you said, describe yeah. Big John. And I said exactly the same thing about Big John. Some people would go, mm. ah, seems like a typical toxic male. You know, he's really assertive, but he's a bit of a bully as well. Yeah. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's like we don't want to hide those great values that are shared by both sexes. But yeah, sometimes yeah, if it's, And that's what I would say about me. It's like if I'm a six foot five white male, whatever, 18, 19 stone that I am now, I fit the goddamn stereotype of a bloody muscle bound, yeah. moronic male firefighter. And those are my words, not yours that I'm not saying all, my, but yeah. I would fit that. You could, you could see a picture of me. Yeah. In a yeah. Case of harassment somewhere. And it would just, I'd fit them all. Yeah. We look like half the people that, that people would put in those photos. And I just think we've got to be so careful that yeah. we don't turn this into, into, into something like that. But 
anyway, I digress. I, I want to talk. No, more no, I think it... what I don't want to uh, miss out on is how how did you actually get into the fight? Because you said you wanted to join like eighteen, nineteen. So is this something you wanted to do uh... since you were a kid, or <laughs> give give us that backstory? Today's podcast is powered by our partner Lifelines and their revolutionary approach to functional hydration. Just like in firefighting, water is essential for body function, but studies show more than 80% of firefighters are dehydrated. A 25-year study findings from the National Institute of Health showed poor hydration to be linked to early aging and chronic disease, and even mild dehydration results in significant negative impact outcomes, including headaches, exhaustion, rapid pulse, irritability, and poor cognitive function. A study conducted by Yale University showed that participants who were just 1% dehydrated had a 12% increase in errors when performing tasks that required cognitive flexibility. In addition, dehydration is shown to worsen mood and attitude, contribute to confusion and poor decision making, and negatively affect memory and judgment. In other words, you really don't want your internet commander, firefighter, or for that matter, any first responder on a critical scene to be even slightly dehydrated. Mild dehydration occurs when a person is just 1.5% dehydrated, a condition that does not even trigger the first response in most people so just imagine how quickly a firefighter or any first responder can and does become dehydrated in their day-to-day duties which is why i address my hydration first thing every day with lifelines go into the notes for this episode and specifically check out lifelines hydro fuel and hydro og by clicking in the notes for the podcast for a clean energy solution designed for those who demand more from their day now back to the show yeah, I joined young, um, but uh, had never really crossed my mind to join the fire service ever. Um, nobody in my family, um, no emergency service links at all. Um, however, yeah, my my childhood, um, I was I was always quite a strong, determined um, child. Um, I was the eldest of two to begin with, and then um, more siblings came as we grew up. But we had quite a difficult sort of younger years. Um, house of happiness but um to, in this sort of younger younger years but um didn't have much didn't have any sort of um really sort of um I would say probably classed as poverty nowadays but there was you know our house had no electric no running no hot water um so we had a really simple life um just in the sort of hills <laughs> honestly it sounds like a movie but you it know was that um, child, though. or is this one of those things you see no on- I had no idea yeah. No, that's the thing, isn't it? Yeah, I didn't know, and I, I couldn't really. And I don't know if well, there's no social media back then, and there wasn't. I mean, even the TV had a coat hanger sticking out the top. It wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't like a. <laughs> we, I didn't really have anything to compare it to. I mean, we did have um, some friends in the village who we sometimes would go in when when um, my mum and dad were working. We had to go be babysat, and they had an incredible house. And I mean, I thought it was incredible because they had lights that worked without a generator. So. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, there was times where we lived a bit of in a caravan. Um, it was, but that was because my my mum and my dad were renovating a house. They bought, you know, a dream um, to do up a barn, and and we became really resilient as kids. We we just appreciated simple things in life. We just were happy. Um, and I mean, we, I was taught to make sand and cement at the age of about four. You know, I'd go and make a mix yeah, for my yeah. dad so we could carry on building. So um, I wasn't never afraid of graft. Always got involved and did what I needed to do to be part of the so to, to, to help the family um and then as I got older um the marriage broke up and then my in my old, my teenage years I was in a family of like domestic violence so um it became difficult and I think my resilience grew in a different way um I learned to be sort of an adult quite quickly and I realized that I I, I was there as a protector in in the house um and I had some brothers as well then, which was lovely. But a lot of us to to kind of um, I felt like I was a big part of that family to try and keep everyone safe. My school year, so I was in a wonderful school, really lovely school. Um, it was just a little small Catholic school, all girls. Um, and I wasn't. I used to work really hard. I, I was a bit of a goof. Um, mess around. I loved a bit of a joke. Um, but school provided a a safe space for me to just be me um I really loved it I mean as much as I tell my kids now I'm like you don't know how lucky you are um and they tell me how much they hate school but I I don't get it because I think because their life as children nowadays they've got everything they literally have everything they need and and they don't appreciate how how most I say most but the majority of people in this country are living um I haven't got what they've got so I at that time had school as a as a release as a safe space um 
And I fell in love with um, the RAF cadets um, in year eight. It was like having another family. Um, and it gave me a drive, gave me something to really work towards. Um, started getting promoted in it because they said that I was a leader. Um, and I enjoyed that. I enjoyed instructing. I enjoyed being being the, the, the ranks within the um, cadets. Um, and just took that throughout my whole high school years. Um, and it gave me... I was, I got my teeth into it so much so that I knew from you quite young that I thought, right, this is it. This is what I want to do. I want to join the RAF. I want to be a pilot. Mm. Um, and, and re- you know, I worked hard. It made me work hard. It made me realize that I need to get my own life. I need to get out of here. And this is how I'm going to do it. Um, so I, I had that drive, um, did really well, um, ended up going to, uh, to some interviews for British Airways. Um, and I got offered a conditional offer to join British Airways as a pilot. Um, if I wow. achieved my, I know, as in, if I achieved my <laughs> A levels, so my dream was all there. It was all coming true, and I was just I couldn't believe it. And and the app, the absolute sort of like flip side of how how everything, you know, if people could see what was going on in my home life at that time, they just would not have believed that you know that I was dealing with that at the same time as really put my head in the books, get it done, get it done, get my life, <laughs> um, and. Yeah, so so life a little bit changed. I went to I went to do my A levels. I had this I had this plan, um, and life took a little bit of a turn. Um, I ended up becoming pregnant with my daughter. Um, so when we talk about resilience. <laughs> that was uh, the plan. Was uh, obviously my daughter came along, and I needed to just recheck, take a pause, um, and plan what I was going to do. And in that interim period, I ended up getting a job, did my A levels. Um, just got a job in uh, building contractors um, as an admin. Um, and, um, oh, God, you know what? That was really the first time from being in a girls' school. Uh, I hadn't ever really experienced sort of sexistness or harassment, um, bullying, anything like that. And then I was a female in a building contractors. And, right, um, an environment. Yeah, you can imagine the sort of um, behaviours and um toxic toxic oh I can't even say the word now how toxic it was in that in that yeah. workplace um so um yeah I mean to be fair it, it, as much as it, it did it helped me grow I would never ever want anyone to go through that um it was completely unacceptable but um I remember an opportunity coming up my mum um found a little snippet in the newspaper that said that the fire service were taking on um firefighters and whether and she print she she cut it out and gave it to me, and um, I took it to work with me this day um, as when I was in the admin job, um, and I read it out sort of whilst I was sat at my desk. And somebody, one of the um, people that worked there, uh, asked what what I was reading, and sort of laughed and sort of screwed it up, threw it in the bin, and said, "The day you become a firefighter is the day I eat my hat, so to speak." Um, and I, it, it, do you know what? It's kind of what I needed. I needed somebody to say that because I'd almost lost a little bit of me in in my drive Absolutely. I had such a drive and then and then I kind of like slumped a little bit it became a mum which was a different part of me which was amazing and I wouldn't change that yeah I know but, but you do as... sacrifice so much of your yeah. self yeah your, your personality yeah. so much of your life your friend structure your body you do Everything, lose yeah. it's a very common thing with mothers that they lose themselves absolutely I mean I'd gone from yeah I'd gone from you know I was in I was playing for Wales and netball teams I was doing all these things I was I had a scholarship pending waiting for that and then I I felt like I'd lost everything I mean uh, my daughter's listening to this I wouldn't change it for the world because I, know, I, know. I wouldn't I wouldn't be where I am now if that hadn't have happened um but um yeah this that comment by that person is almost what I needed to kind of press the reset switch and go okay, wake up, Amy, let's do this. Um, and I applied. Um, I remember telling, I was with my husband who I'm with now. So same, same, we've been together for like 19 years. So, wow. um, congratulations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, congratulations to him. <laughs> <laughs> How, I don't know. <laughs> um, well, we've been through a lot, to be fair. We've grown up together. So, um, yeah, so I applied for it. Um, and I honestly thought, right, you know, it, I, I don't I don't know whether women actually do this job, but I'm going to have a go. Um, there wasn't at the time the same sort of pro, um, do you know the um, the work that goes out there now. Yeah, the positive action, work and positive action to to promote women in the service. Um, but I gave it a go because I thought, you know what, I need to. I got to get out of this office. This is not me. I'm losing me. I'm dying inside. I need to. I need to do something for good. Um, 
and I went for it. I went through the process, uh, and and throughout the whole process, I mean, in my lunch break on this admin job, I used to um, I used to have a load of equipment in my boot. So I found out. I went to one of the local fire stations and spoke to, um, knocked on the door, and uh, a female fire answered the door. I couldn't believe it. I was like, oh my gosh, there's a woman answering the door. <laughs> it was amazing. And you know what? Now I never forget Couldn't that because I think, that. oh, it was amazing because I thought, oh my god, there's a woman that does this job. This is brilliant. Um, and she said she sort of showed me. She showed me what the, the tasks would involve. She showed me how heavy things were. Um, she talked talk to me about the role and um, sort of made me feel excited about it. I was like, oh, my gosh, I can do this. It really was like see it to be it. And I, and I believe it. That's it, isn't it? And I love that, yeah. I love that tagline that they have because you have got to yeah. see it to be it. It changed everything for me. It really did sort of like make me go, oh, actually, do you know what? This is this, – there's women doing this. I can do it. Hmm. Um so uh, yeah, I had all this equipment, equivalent equipment. I didn't have any of the equipment. I had like sandbags in my boot. I had um I bought a dumbbell. Um I had a um I had bought well- welly boots and things so I could so in my lunch break I would um go, drive up the road to this car park and um put all the equipment out quickly in the hour I had and do the do the equipment carry test every day so I could get myself ready oh. and strong. Honestly, it just shows, isn't it? Like when you've got how, drive how were those gym moments engine, and not feeling how did you stop yourself giving up and feeling like a dick? And what I mean by that is, because there will have been, and you've alluded yeah. to them already, people being like, have you seen Have you seen Amy's boots? She's she's probably going yeah. for that firefighter thing, isn't she? She's got, yeah, you should horrible. see got these boots. She's got, hey, yeah. Amy, tell us what you're, uh, tell us, I know it's almost yeah. like that. You just want to go, fuck you. Yeah. Also, you'd be yeah. stopping within your rights to be like, you know what? It's just it's not worth it. I feel stupid. Yeah. Everyone's laughing yeah, at me. Yeah, it's hard. We might not be able to do it. And if I yeah. fail, everyone will know I fail because they know I'm going for it now. Yeah. And that is more than enough to stop yeah. thousands of people even going for it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it goes back to that thing we spoke about before with women and worrying about failure, kind of just stay stay in a safe space. It's like well, God, that, that's the in it's Sabrina's book when she's like, Yeah, men will go for a job if they've got something like 30% yeah, of yeah, requisite yeah. tasks. And women will only definitely go for a job if they've got is 100%. it 90? 100%. Yeah, everything. You've got to have everything. Like, and that's it. Like I look and yeah. it's like and I just I don't know if I said it before the podcast came up, but that audacious self-belief. Yeah. And I would say most of the stuff I do is like like 70% self-belief, 30% knowledge and competency, and just my Absolutely. belief that I will work it out along the yeah. way. When you do look at the, you know, the job spec or the person specification, the requireds and the desireds the characteristics, and you're kind of like, meh, I think I'm about there and I'll learn the rest. But for some women, they're like, oh, well, I'm, I wouldn't be allowed to go for that because I haven't got perfection. And you're like, yeah, dude, or girl, you know, just, just say, it. just go yeah. for it. You don't do don't it. automatically opt yourself out of the thing because what if yeah. you're the perfect person for it and you sit down and you go actually mate I haven't got me yeah. uh me RTCI I've not got my knee bosh I've not yeah. I've actually got a level three teaching and they'll be like no worries Amy we'll smash yeah. that for you we'll get you will you agree to do it in the next three months if you get the job of course I will yeah, boom exactly some people yeah. will go well I haven't got that so I can't do it I'm like don't you know yeah it's so frustrating isn't it for you not to do it. Yeah, it's so ingrained in 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 women. I don't know, and I've seen amount I don't of women. Want to waste I anybody's time. It'd be rude of me to do that. I'm like, don't do yeah. that. Yeah, or I'm. I just don't think I'm ready. The amount of times I hear I speak to oh, women in in our service and in different services, and they say, I, oh, just, I'm just going to give it another year. I don't think I'm quite ready. I don't think I'm quite ready. I don't think I'm quite ready. And yet, you know, the amount of men I speak to, and I'll be like, how's things? Thinking, you know, you've been in two years. How's things? I'm off. Oh, I've put in for my, my my papers, and you think. Some people, they could have been in 20 years, and I think, you're never ready. <laughs> you are yeah. not ready. And the women, you know, I think, oh, my gosh, if you could see you the way I see you, like, you would, you'd be uh, like, oh, she's the next leader. Go for it. Like, you've got to go for this. We need you as a service. And those that should do it the most often are driven to do it the least yeah. sometimes. And it, and yeah. it is so demoralizing to see yeah. sometimes because the, the potential in them is just, they always say it's such a subtle difference between obvious and oblivious. And you look at some people and you're like, it's obvious. And to them, they're like, no, me? Yeah. And you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, it's mad, isn't it? I think the only way we get away from this um, or help with this is a really massive advocate for sort of having a mentor. Um, I yeah. think everyone should have a mentor. So somebody else, is somebody I, somebody else's eyes are actually seeing you as you um, and the qualities that you are. 
and feeding that back to you in it you know it's a completely different person telling you you are ready for this or you need to have a go at this try it go for it um and and just actually somebody to talk things through with as well because um I've had some amazing mentors through um, women in the fire service and it's great to have somebody who's not connected to your own service as well who can you know no bias remove everything you don't know what I've done I'm just telling you this is what's happened how would what do you think and to be honest I mean I don't know if um I don't know how much coaching mentoring you've done but it's incredible isn't it all they basically say is well what would you do <laughs> and it's like actually you've just made me answer my own question you've actually just made me and I, yeah it's a lot of it's incredible power, raise it back open-ended question yeah yeah I'm not, I'm not saying that in a derogatory manner because I've coached people for about 12 years yeah. and uh and it is a lot of that it's helping people I always say get if you get stuck in your head you're dead you know, you've got to get yeah. out of your head. That's why we we think in ink, we write things down, we whiteboard stuff, and we try and take the emotion mm. and the imposter syndrome out of it and just see it on the yeah. on a case of facts. And you go, yeah. You know, I always say to people, yeah. what advice would you give your best friend in the same situation? That's sometimes one yeah. that I go to. And they go, yeah. oh, I'd tell her to go for it. You know, I'd tell, yeah, him, exactly. I'd tell him this. I'd tell him he's got loads of it. I'd tell yeah. him he's great, you know. And why, why are we therefore so, and we are, if, if we would never say the things to other people that we say to ourselves. No, exactly. I know it's crazy, isn't it? It's, it's, if you get in your own head, it, you're, the, you're your own worst enemy. Absolutely. And I know I do exactly this. And sometimes it's, um, I'm great at giving the advice, but not so good at taking my own. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you do think you're so cruel to yourself. Why do you say these things? Why do you put yourself down so much? I always say trying to analyze your way out of self-doubt is like trying to sniff your way out of a cocaine addiction it's just <laughs> yeah. not gonna work you need to just either take massive yeah. action or you need to you need to speak to somebody else you need to get out of you that echo chamber in your yeah you need to soundboard it you just need yeah. to verbally vomit people say oh, yeah. i don't know how to explain it and i'm like if you did know how to explain it what would it sound like yeah. you know just just start vomiting words at me all over the page, all over the the, the conversation, and we'll piece yeah. them together afterwards. Don't worry if it sounds competent or insightful or podcast worthy or any of that rubbish. Yeah. Just how do you feel? It's like you say, you kind of have to either pretend you're telling a friend or with me, I think, what would I tell my daughter? What would I say to my daughter now in this situation? Because that's someone I love beyond words. So I only have the best interest in mind for this person. What would I say? Because mm. it, and then hopefully the words then are enough for me to kind of go right. Well, do that. <laughs> Why am I not doing that? Just do that. Listen to yourself. Go for it. Um. But yeah, I think going back to the original, how do you not let people get into your own head and just give up? Um. It's 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 just so hard, and I'm not gonna. I, I I don't. Anyone listening to this, like going through these these sort of like evils in your head. Um. There's no easy option for that. You've just got to find a drive, find a reason. And actually, if I don't do it, I'm staying where I am. So it was the way out. This is the way out. And and I knew I could do it. I absolutely knew I could do this. It was just a case of like really digging deep and getting um, and, and doing it for, you know, I had my daughter at the time. So doing it for my daughter, doing it for my family. Um, my sister Powerful was... Wine very powerful that is yeah yeah well my sister was um obviously she was only two years younger than me so um she was so I was obviously 19 she was still in school so these things you know I was I was her hero at that time so I needed to do this because I'd I'd had such a going through to the end of school you know there was such high expectations for me to do something amazing and then suddenly sort of everything you heard what Aaron is doing oh she's doing well yeah she's gonna make oh, God, it was horrible. Aaron, she's really yeah. going for it yeah yeah and, and then pregnant. she's pregnant and it's like oh <laughs> yeah it's like oh because like, if that's oh, oh. Ooh, oh. <laughs> um so I really owed it to myself and I've, not to anyone I don't owe anyone but I owed it to myself to, to owe it to yourself to, god damn yeah right, 100%. absolutely to, to, I would to say give you can everything. lie to everybody else it doesn't matter not that you would or yeah. you would but like you can you can bullshit me all you like when you go to bed at night and you lie on your side you close your eyes or whatever you'll know if you really tried You'll know yeah, if you're exactly. the best version of yourself. It doesn't matter what anybody else thinks, really. I mean, it does, and we, to say we don't care what anyone thinks, but that's not the point I'm trying to make. It's about you know whether or not you gave your best. Yeah. You know whether or not you you maliciously sabotaged yeah. yourself and opted out of something. And it's so it's so easy to do that, unfortunately. I wanted to yeah. uh, echo back on something that uh, yeah. that you spoke about earlier that I think is really, really pertinent, only because I have connections to it myself you spoke mm -hmm. about uh having aspects of 
domestic violence in your life. Mm. I'm not going to ask to go into the details or pull anything mm. up about that. But speaking about what that made of you, because my my wife was in a domestic uh, relationship with domestic violence for about 17 years. And one of the mm. things that my daughter has picked up from her, which I'm totally grateful for, is what they say your superpowers sit right next to your scars. Mm. And um, she has an incredible uh, empathetic way about her. And her emotional intelligence is incredibly acute. She works with mm. children with learning difficulties and whatnot now because she has colossal patience and she's really great at reading people. But she's developed that out yeah. of actually a survival. It's like self-preservation. Self-preservation, yeah. trying yeah. to avoid this person losing their shit and hitting me. Yeah. Or So it's sad where it's come from, but it has given her... And the reason I bring that up is because I wanted to overlay it on the fact that when it comes to leaders, which of course you are in, in the fire and rescue service now, but leaders in general, one of the things that we need more, and I think we have lost a lot of, and one of the biggest cultural challenges is about people not having very good emotional intelligence, not being able to mm -hmm. read the room, read their audience, to connect with people, to build rapport. And I don't want to make it a sex thing because I don't think it is truly accurate that it only belongs to women, but I think it is... Mm -hmm more typical and i don't know if that's a paternal instinct i don't know or maternal instinct sorry what's as i <laughs> sort of as i said myself as i verbally vomit at you there <laughs> does any of that hit the wall does any of that yeah, make yeah. sense what's your yeah. thoughts on that yeah i think well I, you're just gonna echo what you say really in regards to it i think you know going back to those years um reading a room reading behavior reading tone of voice everything even reading context of texts things like that you know um documents now um you can having that type of intelligence it's i don't know how you learn it but it's i think it has to come from self preservation it's, it's keeping yourself alive it's um it's been able to be ahead of the game with regards to how's this going to play out now um yeah and uh, and I think, yeah, as much as those, uh, even now, you know, I think I can tell when something's, it, it's hard because, it's, um, sorry, I'm just like saying no words here, am I? But no, no, you are. It's because it's very difficult to kind of put into words. But as much as those situations at those times were just the worst parts of my life ever, but it has given me a resilience in regards to, I can, I'm, I feel like I'm emotionally intelligent. I feel like I can, I can read a person without words. I can feel them. Mm. I can feel the energy they're giving off. Um, and I and I can even match that or counteract it to fix the problem. Um, You've got to learn how to mirror people, haven't you? Yeah, that's, absolutely. That's what I try yeah. and coach people with yeah. is yeah. that mirroring, both in tone, context, um, yeah. you know, posture, breathing. Uh, and people say, "Oh, you mean, you mean manipulate people, Pete?" Oh no, no, no. Well, absolutely not. No, it's not. It's not. It, it's it is manipulation, so. but manipulation is everything. Like me and my part, like I'm, I'm manipulating Amy in this conversation. Yeah, because I want to have a good conversation with Amy. Yeah, I want us mm. to have a great back and forth. I want mm. her to feel heard. So mm. I am going to paraphrase some of the things she says. I'm going to. I want to build rapport with Amy because mm. I want us to have a great conversation. Oh, so you mean you're changing? So you're not normally like that, then, Pete? You're, you're, you're manipulating her. But and I'm like. No, but I am trying to build rapport. Yeah. It's not about being two faced. Yeah. It's about knowing your audience. And I think yeah, that's it's a very difficult that. one mm. to to try and explain to people. Yeah, it's hard to that's why I said that's why I think I've struggled to find the words because it's it's um it being able to have that connection means that whatever that interaction is, is going to be more successful should it be a negative thing that you're dealing in with the same way like for yourself stuff. now if you're in a station manager's meeting or you're in a regional meeting or you're speaking to the senior leadership team Absolutely. you are going to communicate different than when Absolutely. you go on station and visit a watch yeah absolutely. yeah and that's not because you're two-faced it's because you've got no. a different audience yeah it's because yeah. you're, you're 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 actually complimenting them by relating to that organ audience you know Absolutely, and it, it's yeah. just different and you you have to be able to be the chameleon yeah you do put that you put those hats on don't you and I think it's um there's, there's obviously a wardrobe of hats and I think everyone gets them and as you get promoted or you move into a different role or a new experience in your life you do gain another hat that you need to um mm. you may need to put on at a certain time however what I always say is make sure that hat fits your head though make sure you are you make sure you are authentic and you are 
dealing with this as What's you would deal with this. That hat? Yeah. Don't wear someone else's hat. Yeah. Don't, don't borrow a hat. On. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't put someone else's hat on. Be what you deal with this the way you would deal with this, because I can guarantee that's the way it needs to be dealt with by you. So um because otherwise people will see that the hat falls off they can see that's not you what you you know or that doesn't feel credible or authentic um so yeah I think um it, it, through all the different experiences I've dealt with in my life and yeah that that area there I mean another thing is I've, I've got an awful lot of empathy I think from from that from that time in my life dealing with those things um empathy in regards to not just um not just the subject of like domestic violence, but but just knowing that people have got things going on in their lives. Like work is not everything. There are people, these are humans with lives, with families, with everyday issues. Um, and we just don't know what's going on behind that door because um, like I say, many people didn't have a clue what was going on behind my door. They thought, oh, look, she's a joker. She's funny. She's um, she's doing well in a netball. She's achieving. She's got this scholarship. She must have everything going on. And you think, well, actually, do you know what? How far how far you were from the truth at that point in regards to behind that door you just don't know what was going on so me as a leader now um I have that empathy I have that understanding and well that aspect of hu of humor and achieving as well is something that you see in comedians and there's some really dark stories behind mm -hmm. some of the greatest comedians of all time yeah. and many of yeah. them had parents of domestic violence and they became yeah. funny because it was a way to interrupt the pattern at home yeah it was absolutely a way to bring levity to the situation yeah. so they did it for their parent that was having a rough life or they were being abused and they became something mm. that the parent could distract themselves with take pride in you know be, be yeah in, be sort relax of a minute for... relax mm. around yeah. yeah you um we spoke before we came on about this aspect of sort of changing hats changing masks and also i then asked about changing opinions because there's um there's a great photo. I don't know if you've ever seen it, where the caterpillar sat down with the butterfly. Have you ever seen that photo? Uh, I don't think so. No. Oh, it's a great one. I'll have to send it to you. Um, it basically the caterpillar <laughs> says to the butterfly, "You've changed," and the butterfly <laughs> says, "Yeah, we're supposed to." Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I did one of my favorite photos. Brilliant. Ever. <laughs> um, because and the, the, the relevance to our conversation is when people when people move through organizations and their role or seniority changes people think that their opinions change and that oh you've yeah. bought the farm you swallowed the pill you've whatever mm. you've whatever and i'm like mm. no you sometimes you just become exposed to more knowledge you become you have a more holistic understanding of the purpose of the emergency services or even like zoom yeah. out even more the purpose of community and society then the purpose of the government the purpose of first responders yeah, the purpose yeah. of the fire and rescue service and how that golden thread as we all like to allude to fits into what we're doing and you know, the needs of the many must outweigh the needs of the the few or the one. I forget who said that, but it was, it was a great quote. It wasn't mine. Um, so the most important thing to that firefighter on that station sometimes just can't happen. Um, and that's yeah. not out of malice. And that's not despite all your best intentions and everything you would love to be able to do for that person right here, right now. Mm. You have to think about the wider understanding sometimes. But how have you... So two levels to that question. Mm -hmm. When did you first start wanting to 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 pursue development um may that be promotion or whatever and then as you kind of move through those roles into where you are now how has your perspective on stuff kind of changed um so i mean it's probably not the answer you want but the originally the um the opportunity for um promotion came to me i'd been about i'd been in the service for about four years i was living away from my family um like i spoke about earlier um, and I really thought it's just getting to a point where I might have to leave the service because I couldn't stay away from my family any longer. It was becoming so difficult to to manage. Um, I really was looking for opportunity to to, to for something else. Um, and I really had to weigh up sort of um, work life balance at that point. Um, but an opportunity came up for a secondment. Um, into uh, and you know what funny enough I honestly was at that I was in that mindset of I'm not ready I'm not going for promotion I'm absolutely not ready for that I've been in four years I know nothing you know everyone else on my watch I was the first female in the station everyone else had been in for years and years and it felt like hundreds of years but they were they were in for 15 mm -hmm. years um so I I didn't think there's no way I'm ready anyway an opportunity came up for a secondment to work with the police to do a project and I went for it and I got it and it changed it changed everything for me in regards to 
um, start to see the outside of my bubble and start looking at what else is going on across this service and other services and sparked a new interest into like um, sort of the politics of how we do things, the politics in regards to sort of um, national politics. I looked a little yeah. bit out, like, why why do the governments do this? Why are we not getting funding? Why are we getting funding? Blah, blah. Local governments and how we're funded. Um, and then sort of personal, how am I dealing with people all the different organizations, all the different departments when the service I didn't even know existed. So it started that process for me, kind of forced the process for me. Um, and then I realized that I was loving it, really enjoying it, um, look for other opportunities. I wasn't chasing promotion. I was chasing a new challenge, to be honest. Um, I'm never, the same. I chase yeah. exciting stuff. Yeah. <laughs> no, I just I really wanted something. Yeah, I wanted something that would challenge me and sounded a bit more exciting. I've always been, I've really liked hands-on jobs where I can be out there. I love firefighting. Honestly, best job in the world. I love it. Um, but I also love instructing. So I did a bit of time with um I, I went for a comment as an instructor um in training. Uh, and I loved that really, really great. You must have been in training for a while because you you did all of your tickets, didn't you? You qualified yeah. teacher, you've yeah. got your level five diploma and apprenticeship, you're an RTCI, a BAI, fire behavior yeah. instructor, your knee bosh. You yeah. you are a, a very qualified individual. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> didn't do all them through training. Uh, I did training as a as a support instructor. So I went through um, some of it. I went to operations. I, I mean, other services call it different things, but basically where all your policy procedure equipment is dealt with. Yes. Um, I went into that department and that was, at the time, I was reluctantly sort of took that role, um, thinking, oh, it sounds terrible, it sounds so boring. Um <laughs> went into the went into it honest to god i loved it i absolutely loved it and until this day um probably one of my favorite roles as a watch manager was in that um department because you're responsible for like everything you know in regards to equipment that we use the training how we're going to implement training and then tell training you work with them um you know, direction of the service it's just it was incredible massive eye opener um but then i i didn't want to go for any further promotion before I'd gone back to station and worked on a watch um, as a watch manager um, and had my own watch. Um, so what, so that's what I went for next. I went for a sideways move and um, went back to a station, um, worked as a watch manager. Uh, oh gosh, um, again, incredible. I just loved it. Worked with, I was really lucky. I had the best bunch of um, crew, um, really busy station, uh, but then COVID hit and it, it was a challenge for everyone, but not least sort of management and leadership at that point to try and um, keep the sort of keep the culture, keep the oh, positive. It oh, it was so time. hard. It Everybody really was, was. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're such, we're such like, we're, we're in the public eye, aren't we? We love going out and speaking to people. We love getting out there and doing nothing. We love drilling and all this thing, but everything stopped. Um, mm. And we were told at the point, at that point that not, you know, we even got to a point where we had to be, in different Separate rooms, rooms. unless yeah. yeah so on every door um, it was like maximum two people and you're like yeah oh. yeah and you're glancing through the window you're like well i can't go in there i'll really just keep challenged. wandering around the station on my own shall i horrible and horrible you pressure see, cooker little bubbles they create yeah and it's that like you say emotional intelligence there at that point trying to see people were dipping i had a really positive um um happy watch um and slowly sort of you could see it dipping and you could see people dealing with did their own personal things going on in their own lives with regards to covid um yeah. but trying to make work um not an additional sort of task but an, an escape from what was going on in real world really is what i tried to produce and we did that through sort of um I came up with some sort of like tasks for them to do and it gave them all like a subject to to create a training session but but with COVID rules surrounding it so they had to create a training package say for instance for water um with with the so it kind of made it fun you know so yeah. these are, this is this is your task these are the um, limitations how are you going to do it and oh it was brilliant we came up with some really good things and and everybody's um mentality was just they loved it. it it made it a positive experience um which was really difficult and exhausting for me and the management mm. team um but but vitally important that that effort was put in rather than shut down and everyone go and hide in your rooms where the, the mental health of everyone would be um a detriment um it made it that people were actually enjoying that time we had together because it was like right what's tonight what are we doing today what's yeah, what's yeah, today's yeah. drill and how are we going to do this um we did you know, loads of quizzes and things like that, but um, 
Yeah, it's um, difficult that time, but really um, grew me as a leader and a manager, I think, learning how to sort of adapt in those situations. And then, yeah, the opportunity came up. I'd done my papers and my exams a few years before it, but I wasn't, go back to, I wasn't ready, but I genuinely wanted more time as a watch manager. I loved it. I really enjoyed the job. Um, And then- How did you deal with that challenge of going from like a high paced, every day is different job people will be surprised the next words that I say, but non-operational job. Because sometimes when you go on station, yeah, you get the calls and yeah, you're busy, but sometimes it's also Groundhog Day. Yeah. Yeah, it can be. And I think um, it, it's it's definitely tough for, I'd say, people coming in the service new because they I think everyone thinks it's like Chicago Fire. And, um, <laughs> we, you know, this shock when they're like, what, we haven't had a call all day. Um, <laughs> it's like, yeah. yeah, this might be many days um but I well the way I used to sort of manage that was to keep everyone busy and have um sort of realistic expectations as to what the next shift was going to be um but also involve everyone in that so uh I'd give responsibility to I had a watch of 14 so um I'd split up a that's a great size watch yeah a really big watch and but also really easy to have clicks if it's not managed really well so mm-hmm. um you don't want to create clicks. Um, you want to make sure everyone's um, working together as one team, um, which needs finger on the pulse, but also but it, not too, you know, you don't want to be crushing that. You don't want to be sort of uh, autocratic sort of um, so watch talk, manager. Talk but, about um, that. Again, I'm, we're not pretending for either of us to be experts in this, but this might be some really useful, tangible stuff. Because I hmm. think, you know, some of what we spoke about before and some of what we've come to talking about and what we're already talking about really is cultures. And when I look at larger watches, at times I think the culture is, sometimes I think it's easier to manage because it can self-correct itself. You know, there are those people, watches that have really strong values and are really outspoken in a positive way. And uh, the changing room can calibrate itself. But if you've got a very small watch and you're just a single crew or whatever on a single pump station, there's only four of you there Mm -hmm. for that day. If one of you is in a shit mood, then 25% mm. of your workforce is having a terrible day. Yeah. And that can really quickly bleed into everyone else. And there's not the ability to dissipate it amongst the large watch. But equally with a large watch, there comes the challenges of creating personal connections. And this is sometimes yeah. where our crew commanders or, or crew managers can have an opportunity to flourish more because they do have their own um, line management. And they do have their own couple of people sometimes to lead. So how did you kind of manage that. And again, this is not us pretending to be experts, but just maybe some tips and tricks. And certainly for some of the the female watch managers that are out there, how did you kind of interact with people? How did you do that pulse check? How did you make sure everyone was was kind of happy? And how did you work it? To be fair, I think I'd rather you ask the watch this question. <laughs> I know, it's so tough to ask yourself. No, it's, no, it's, it? fine, it's, it's like, fine. Well, I don't know, maybe I was terrible at it. I don't know. I'm yeah, tell yes, you, I'm really think, you could think you've done well at it and then actually the watch can tell you something, tell you otherwise. Um, but no, I think um, I think I go back to what I've said a few times is I was authentic. I was me. I just dealt with this, how I would deal with this and how I would want to be uh, managed and led. Um and like I think you mentioned then regards to the leader of the watch isn't necessarily that senior rank. It could be the firefighter. It's um it's really important that you you identify who the leaders of your watch or station are. Cultural and architect. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You need to get their buy-in. Um and and I think it goes a little bit back to what we said about manipulating. It's not manipulating, but it's making sure that you have everyone on the same page and we understand what we're trying to achieve here. Um, what do we want our work? What do we want our work day and our, our crew to look like and how are we going to get there? Um, and if if we've got um, individuals who are those strong opinions, um, who, um, who who influence um, sort of the culture of the watch, well, then we need to really make sure that they're on side with what we want it to look like and what the service need it to look like. Um, so I, I think, um, yeah, number one, be authentic, be you. Don't try and be somebody else. Put your hat on. Nobody else is. Um, number two, make sure everybody's got a sense of purpose on that watch, especially bigger watches. Um, you can quite easily let um, it become Groundhog Day, like you said. Um, if we're quiet and nobody's got a sense of purpose or nothing, um, no actual sort of um, responsibility, mm. then you can lose people. And then and then that's where we start to see that um, 
they they make make themselves busy and that can then also create issues um for for themselves for us for for a culture um mm. because oh gosh you know I, I it, during covid was a great example and actually during what was one of our worst times in actually a bit of an experiment to see how people behave in these lockdown conditions um mm. and you see the watches and the stations that you know weren't necessarily doing as much proactive work as um as we were um we're finding issues we're finding problems we're sort of challenging senior management we're um falling out amongst themselves and that's exactly what i say about that go back to um they will find to things themselves to do uh, keep people busy white um, space in the calendar is a breeding ground yeah, for that dangerous a, a busy watch dangerous. is a happy watch we need absolutely. to have a purpose we need to have a focus we need to have a reason yeah. for being yeah absolutely and you know as giving people a purpose um it's, it's 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 not as hard as it sounds it's so you just need to speak to people listen to what they're saying understand your watch understand the people on that watch and who you've got and whereas you might have somebody who's very quiet or or um you know seen as a difficult character well listen to that person speak to that person and find out what is going on what's that person's strength what can I use that then how do I use what that person's strength is to assist in what I'm trying to achieve here um understand and, the reward matrix as well like understand how yeah, they like to sure. receive um praise yeah. like do they want it publicly do they want it privately are they driven yeah. by um accolades or like adulation from their team or are they driven yeah, by adulation absolutely. from their respect or they're driven by rank or are they driven yeah. by money or what 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 makes them want to be yeah absolutely why are they here what do they take reward from yeah absolutely uh, and and that was um and you know I enjoyed that element of I enjoyed it's like being an orchestra of it's um the lead of an orchestra and you can you can see how how quickly if you don't give the attention it's needed to individuals um and and I suppose on a grander scale um this is looking at the organization it's certain that they need people need recognition and if it's not like I say it might not be an award or or an email even it could just be a like pop in and have a chat you know this is my office door I used to always be open and um it would always very quickly be closed again because there was always somebody who would come in and have a little chat with me and catch up or or I'd just see someone walking down the corridor you know looking a little low um pull them in have let's have a chat or go and grab us a brew let's have a chat um, don't wait for people to come to you. Usually people that need to speak to you are the ones who aren't coming to you. Um, hmm. Just be emotionally intelligent and and look for that. People um, think it might sound a little bit cold, but I actually genuinely used to hold a spreadsheet because my name <laughs> was terrible. I had hold a spreadsheet of like when I had interactions with people. I wouldn't. It wasn't like a document I shared with anybody to report anything. It was just a yeah. memory for me because there were larger check teams in. and stuff like that. It's just yeah. check in, and you could yeah. you could just invent anything to talk about. Just ask their opinion on something. Yeah. You know, just yeah. get their thoughts on something. But I'd also use it to like remember pertinent things about them because I I want to remember that. Mm. My short term memory is terrible. Some of my neurodiversity is, doesn't lend itself to short term memory, mm. and uh, so like if someone told me about the family or their kid's birthday or what I want I want to remember that and it is really important to me but it would fail me sometimes mm. so I would just note it down on my phone or something so that I can ask them about you know their kids thing yeah. or their whatever because I do genuinely care and I'm genuinely interested my memory is just terrible sometimes yeah and I don't yeah. think and of course I would say that's my own bias I don't think that makes you a bad person the fact that you have to write that down people say oh if you really cared you just remember it mate I forget my anniversary I forget my kids <laughs> birthdays yeah, for God's sake, I, know, you know, hard, I, I forget it? stuff that's important to me personally. Yeah. So I'm going to forget other stuff. Yeah. And do you know what? I say, I remember doing a, um, an interview once and you had to write how you would um, how you would uh, develop a high-performing team. And I did so much research. I did so much reading about different um, different in, um, experiments that happened about how to pr- pr- um, create a high-performing team. And actually, do you know what? I sat back, pushed all the papers away, close the laptop and just thought how do I perform a high how do I create a high performing team and actually I've just really got to care I really just need to give a shit and yeah. I love I love the people who I'm trying to create as a high performing team I love the service mm. um, but I think and, it, and I know it can sound soppy and soft but if you don't really care about the people like the watches that I've managed I genuinely care about every single individual on that watch and I loved our watch we were we were you know it was almost like 
I think we even created a festival called Red Fest because we're Red Watch and yeah. um, we had t shirts <laughs> made. It became honestly like a huge Absolutely. fan club. Thing. But I think if you don't love and own what you're a part of and don't own feel like it's a great one. Yeah. yeah be ownership. part of that family. Be part be part of that family and know what your position is in that family in regards to what are you bring into it? What are you, you know, who are you in this? Do you know why you're here? Have that sense of purpose. And Otherwise, if I'm just trying to manage a high performing team of individuals who I don't understand, don't know them, they, they've just come off the street. Well, my first step is to get to know them. I need to know who I'm dealing with here. I need to really understand your values, beliefs, mm. where you're at, your life. Um, and then I can start building from there as as your manager. But then more importantly, I think really as your leader to inspire you to then grow for us all to kind of grow as a team. We know that about communities. We always say that about communities, you know, really care and really get to know and understand yeah. the, the leaders and the demographic and the yeah. landscape. Well, every station is like that. And every Absolutely. one in that station has a different landscape. Yeah. But certain services have gone in a different direction where they've taken the names off pumps, like the names of the stations off pumps. Mm. I would love to see, look, if you want to have whatever three, mm. six, Papa one written yeah. on your top, if you want to have your call sign on yeah. some t-shirts, as long as it's like it's passion, isn't it? Prolific. And you know, yeah. it's, it's corporate logos, the same yeah. and the color schemes, the same and whatever I would yeah. do it for them. I'd say, look, yeah, I love it. Yeah. The t-shirt costs 15 quid. Uh, the service will subsidize it 10 quid. Oh, for whatever. Yeah. Do you know what yeah. I mean? People no, I would do it because yeah. they'd be like, yeah, I want to be known as red watch, whatever. Do you yeah, know what I mean? Absolutely. And I want my name, I want the station name to be on our truck. So I look after the truck. So I don't yeah. want to see it looking like rubbish. I don't want to see stuff missing out the lockers, stuff damaged. Yeah, but absolutely. If you, let, if you don't let people take identity of it, yeah, then they're not going to be proud of it. Yeah. Because then you're just saying, oh, you're just one big, um, you know, yeah. amalgamated lump of everyone's the same we took it during covid we took it so this is one of the activities was to produce a so we were joking we were like chicago fire this is this is chicago fire of north wales um <laughs> we said um so we had a competition so you could make a logo for our watch so everyone went away and made a logo yeah. it was simple things like that you know people if they didn't care and they were like i don't even get why you're doing this, this is ridiculous this is so stupid um but i had you were you know 14 logos produced to me <laughs> so yeah people care they love the watch they're on they love the culture they're in within that watch so how is it that we can't produce that in every watch? It's possible. We're all humans. Nobody, you know, I didn't handpick the people on that watch. They were random individuals. And actually, during the time I was there, I think from the time I started on that, I was only in, in the station for two two years. Um, and the time I was there, there was only three people who remained from the time I was there to the time I left. And the culture remained the same. It's the way we lead people. It's the way we manage. And it's understanding the differences and being able to... Um, sort of continue with that and re reinforce. yeah reinforce it that's the word and um, reinforce it throughout the whole time that we um are in have the opportunity to do so in that position uh, and you know I go back I'm still invited to like the, the Christmas dues the teams that I've managed um I'm still invited to like the you know the um sometimes I'll be like you put boss you pop in station for a meal just for like a have tea with us yeah. um and it's really important that I I do that because that's that's me. That's what I would do as Amy, not as station manager, but more as Amy. Um, yeah. So no matter what rank I am, I will still always have that grounding that, yes, I was a firefighter, and this is important that we keep those cultures going, um, regardless of rank. Um, well, however, that relates to a great... Have you ever heard of something called Nimawashi? Oh, yes, yeah. Uh, Nimawashi is a, is a Japanese uh, term that means to to dig or work around the roots. And it's about yeah. careful attention to all the different aspects of something. And people yeah. often speak about it in, in like business or foundation terms about keeping those yeah. cultural connections, those cultural ties to people at all levels of the organizations and yeah. not forgetting where you came from and being able to you know, lay the groundwork and building consensus yeah. and you know yeah. it helps you it's a big principle of you know in enabling you to implement change and stuff like that is having those Definitely. cultural architects like we spoke about before um yeah. because you 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 should do that and you should never forget you know people say oh, don't forget where you come from they say it like a threat or like you you become no no or something but it's like no you, you shouldn't ever forget where you come from no, I think it's just sometimes you you know sometimes um uh well definitely as you sort of get promoted your um objectives slightly change um however 
what I've found is that actually I can be a great source of information for the people who question why decisions are made. So just mm. ask me. I mean, I'll be as honest as I can be with you where I can. Um, yeah. You know, where, but the information is there. So if the decision has been made and you, you don't understand why or you feel that it's not the right decision or, or you know, whatever, it, just just ask the question. And I think sometimes um, the lack of communication can be where then um, speculation oh. Oh, oh, and it just becomes then that people are uh, make up what their own truth. We fill in the blanks. Yeah, it's they make up their own truth. Mechanism. It's like, yeah. well, Amy's, you know, Amy's just cut the line. You know, the, the, the line's just gone dead. Yeah. But why yeah. did that happen? Well, Amy was obviously bored with me. Amy yeah. was horrible. Amy was didn't want to talk to me. She's just very rude, actually. Yeah, yeah. A really rude person because I don't know why it happened. And I will naturally fill in the blanks and come up with a reason. And out of a self-defense, I'll come up with a bunch of negatives. Yeah. You know, I won't I won't give her the benefit of the doubt and say, well, yeah. actually, we had a great conversation up until that point, And likelihood is something outside of her control just happened. And I'm sure she'll get back in contact and blah, blah, blah. I know that's just yeah. a micro example. But we, if we don't understand the why behind something, we fill in the blanks. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's really important. I think during COVID again is a great example because the watches, you know, were, there were so many changes that came in every sort of every other day it fell at the beginning and the rules would change. And it's exactly the same with what was happening in the country, wasn't it? That we, yeah. first we were at home, then we couldn't stay at home, then we were going at home. And um, the difficulty is if people don't have the information to support why the decisions are being made, then like no. you say, they make their, make their own truths, which is as a manager, what I've always tried to do um, is try and be, honest about what I can be honest with and ask them well what would you do then what other options are there um and and hopefully then it sort of grew the the person has grown with that with that situation with that issue and actually had an understanding of oh, actually do you know what I get it okay it's fine I get it it's all too all too often I hear oh I can't believe this or I can't believe that person's done that um and you you know I try and teach people to sit sit and listen and think about it from as many perspectives as you can before you um fully air your opinion um out to the masses because straight away then you've got a lot of voices a lot of ears listening to what you said it then gets spread and it's so it's so easy to spread that negative culture um yeah. if we don't know the facts surrounding it so yeah i, I think honestly control exercise with uh with my watch during the uh during the beginning of the pandemic because like you said we will have just got told things not solicited not asked for advice and blah 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 because it was mm. just the government decided this and yeah yeah it's a bit different and i used to say to people like let's go back to the sphere is it in our sphere what's in our sphere of control well, what's in our exactly. sphere of control is yeah what we can do on station each day you know our thoughts our actions the way we treat each other that's pretty much all that sits within our sphere of control. We can't control what the service does. We can't really we can have an impact and influence on changing policies, but very delayed, very limited. Yeah. Um, but there's actually a lot of stuff that sits in our sphere of control. Most of the stuff that results in our fulfillment of how much we enjoy our day to day life is in our sphere of control. Yeah. But you're choosing yeah. to focus on these very few things outside of our sphere of control that yeah. you can't do anything about. And you're making them yeah. ruin the rest of the day for everyone yeah. else and yourself. Yeah. And you know what? They the people they get fixated on things. I mean humans seem to be fixated on negative um just negative news, negative comment, neg negative thought. And and it's really, it's, um, it spreads like wildfire, doesn't it? You know, mm -hmm. as soon as one person starts, you know, you won't believe what I heard today. And then someone will go, what? And then they'll much rather something negative come out of their mouth than something positive, because it's much more interesting to sort of then try and put the pieces together to work out what you think the truth is. But actually. That's the herd mentality behind oh, it's so the, frustrating. Rustle in the bushes. Yeah. Because it's a survival mechanism. If we yeah. go, what was the rustle in the bushes? Well, you know, the survivor and the pessimist, well, the pessimist is often the survivor most of the time because the pessimist says it's probably a lion. Yeah. And yeah. Go, yeah. It, it's a lion. Everybody run. Yeah. And even if we were wrong, we all still survived. Yeah. And if we were right, we still survived. Yeah. But the optimist, it goes, maybe it's just some kittens. You know, <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's just the wind. But we might all die. But if you're right, <laughs> fair enough. But if you're wrong, I'm not going to die. We're all yeah, going to die. I'm going to run <laughs> just in case. And I'm going to run screaming lion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that everyone yeah, exactly. else screams lion until yeah. you know, the other side of it. And no one ever heard the rustle in the bushes. They're all just screaming lion. Everyone's just running. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, herd mentality, isn't it? Follow the sheep. Do what everyone else does. I want to be really respectful of your time, but I'd be remiss if I didn't ask about that sort of most recent transition from 
stepping away from from the oh yeah, group, yeah. stepping away from the upside of it because that's a big move i mean what was the the thought process behind that where are you at and i'm not trying to ask you to give away your five-year development plan or anything like that but <laughs> kind of like you know it's a big it's a big step and yeah, uh yeah. and it's it's something probably a lot of people are aspiring to uh, there's obviously a lot of we're hemorrhaging skills and, and we're having a lot of retirement now. So more people will be making the transition that you have made into different levels of organization. So like, how have you found it? What what was the driver behind doing it? And maybe what what advice would you give to anybody? Maybe things they could avoid or things that you would ask them to consider first if it's right for them? That's a, that's a big question. Um, <laughs> um, but Oh, gosh, right. So like I say, I've really carefully considered my career up to, well, throughout, but up to now even. Um, and I'm making sure. It. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I do. I do wing it. Well, I do wing it. I do. <laughs> One day I'm not saying that's out. worked well. It's worked very badly sometimes. <laughs> but I think, well, I've carefully considered in regards to not rushing it. Um, I've done it I've done it my pace uh, and and as much as I have uh, respected that there's been opportunities available or or that maybe you know underrepresented groups especially women in leadership has been um, I was about to say because there are those that recognize you as the minority within the minority Absolutely. and will go well yeah. Amy we need the next female chief yeah yeah well that's the thing and I think there's that sort of moral um dilemma of oh, I need to kind need of do, to do my it thing. for everyone I need, else. Yeah, yeah, I need to do it. I need to do what I need to do here. Um the 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 fire and rescue service need this. Um yeah. but also uh but what do I want? What do I need? And and I think what I've tried to do over over the years as I've sort of matured is is really focus on today and how do I feel right now? Am I am I enjoying where I am? If I'm happy um and this is a great and what you know why would I go for promotion if I'm if I'm loving life right now as in the days when you don't enjoy it is there a tip yeah well yeah I mean think the days that I don't enjoy I have to then reflect on it I think tomorrow let's not do that today um but don't don't just go for promotion because um it's like somebody's telling you to or or that you feel a moral compass to do so Mm. um do it when it's right for yourself just really sort of think about it because I know I've had an awful lot of people come to me and ask um male female um you know I'm thinking of putting my name in for in the hat for for the crew managers or for watch managers or station managers um but I don't know because I just don't know what to do so I always sort of say to people right okay so let's imagine you get it okay you get the job um and you're happy that you're going to obviously have to leave the position you're in now and then you're going to end up wherever you know you don't know really where you're going to end up I said how do you feel about that and some people most people say oh gosh I don't want to leave the watch right okay so you know the chances of you getting a position on the watch is very very fine um (laughs) so what are you doing then and then sometimes they'll go right actually you know what I don't know why I'm doing this right okay there we go it's a really simple sort of way to look at it because if you want more money there's lots of ways to get more money Especially oh yeah. If you're on a 224 system, just start a side hustle, do another thing, you yeah, know, whatever. Yeah. You don't have yeah, to Yeah, develop yourself in other ways. Yeah, yeah you can 100%. absolutely. Yeah, but if it's for money, then you wouldn't go for promotion because obviously there's not an awful lot of money in promoting yourself, you know, you wouldn't get an awful lot difference. So you're definitely having something else on the side where you can um self-develop in other ways. That's mm. that's better. But um but then I think for me myself, I've obviously the time has to be right. I've also, you know, never rushed it, sort of looked at um when I when I feel like I'm ready um identify when you're ready also be like 14 15 now something like my that. daughter she's 16 nearly 17 she's 17 next in Sorry. two weeks yeah no oh gosh don't I feel super old um I've that, also got well, son, my youngest is, uh, well. is 11 now so it's kind of like giving me yeah. that dependence back as well because now she walks yeah. herself to school yeah. and me and my wife can That's great, have some more it? of our yeah. own adventures and I can do a bit more focusing back on my yeah. career and podcast and whatever that's what that's what's meant for me you know because i've got a son as well he's 11 um and um the same for him then is he walking himself to school uh, is he, well is it, distance or is wise, travel distance yeah, yeah it's a little bit further but he's but if i hadn't had my daughter and as young as i had i mean i'm quite young in the sort of um in the service still um but I, but you know that's it's because exciting. that's allowed me to do yeah. that yes allowed me to do that i've had yeah. that opportunity i've had i've done mothering quite young um, I managed to sort of pull myself back and then go for it. And this is my time for my career. So it gives you your freedom back to do that. And, and although those years were quite difficult whilst they were very young, um, the services to be, you know, are, are 
quite good in sort of trying to find ways to assist you and help and work around that until yeah. it gets to a point where right now go <laughs> let's do this let's go I think and we're both speaking out of our own bias because I don't think there's any right way to do it but I don't think I'd have done it differently because I'm 33 yeah. and my youngest is is 11 so I've done it similar to yourself whereby I still feel like I'm very young still feel like I'm mm-hmm. a baby you know what I mean I've got 25 years ahead of me in the fire and rescue service if yeah. I want to um and I've already got 16 17 years or whatever behind me so I've got a little bit of observation a little bit of uh, viewpoint I, w- I was about to say wisdom but I don't think that would be for me to say <laughs> probably probably no wiser than I ever was but I've got a lot of experiences and yeah. different things no better or worse than anybody else but now I feel a little bit more personally qualified in my own personal drivers and recognizing when I do want to do something and why I want to do it. And I could think I just think I understand myself a bit more. Yeah, definitely. Uh, It's, it's, that's the thing is I I think sometimes though people see uh, like us as younger in these ranks um, and, but yet we started very young as well. So we have got that. um, Yeah. Sort of underpinning knowledge and um, experience that, we do bring with being younger in the service and yet still it feels like forever to go till we actually retire but we have still got that experience and those years to give to the services still so I think we're in a good I'm position so excited for about it. I don't even yeah, know if I'll do the whole time at this moment I can't see why I would want to leave I really really yeah. love it but I'm also not so romantic to think that I'll do all this time in you know the same services or I won't yeah. move again or I won't yeah. you know move departments stations I'm absolutely fine with it. And the more I do stuff like the podcast, the more opportunities kind of lay themselves before you and you go, wow, it's a big world out there. There's lots of really cool stuff to do. And I'm a big one for chapters of life as well. I often think people that have spent 15 years, with all due respect, on one station, on one watch, I'm like, that's, you know, it's like I've got 15 years of experience. And I'm like, no, you've got one year of experience 15 times yeah often yeah. and i'm saying that with absolute respect and those people are the backbone of the services and you know I'm they're happy more... if they're happy that's the thing i think you're just no. gonna think are well, you happy thing, with your life just move watch stay on the same station but move on to a different watch because yeah. you'll meet a bunch of different people yeah and you will develop and you will grow or just yeah. you know if you want to move stations go for it you know go into that technical rescue yeah. thing it's not forever nothing's yeah. forever it's funny okay? isn't it <laughs> it's just yeah like, i think like i say before earlier, move, whatever. if i had if i hadn't have been sort of not pushed but if those opportunities weren't in the early days if they hadn't have come about i would i thought do you know what i would happily stay on this watch on the station forever because there was there were brilliant brilliant individuals and some amazing leaders who taught me an awful lot which have helped me for my career but um if but i hadn't have been a little bit move, pushed you're not happy I'm yeah like, well, yeah amy i thought you liked it on red watch what's, yeah. what's the problem it's not Tell personal. Us what's wrong and we're like <laughs> yeah. no 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 but how audacious yeah. of me to think there's not also really interesting people on blue watch in that other station or in that other department yeah, or at exactly. headquarters or in the training department Change your life, can't it? everywhere yeah. yeah absolutely and i thought that's what i've loved you know I've, in the, my position now i'm so i'm station manager now in the operations so i come back to operations department as a station manager now um and I'm responsible for the NOG implementation across um, our service. Um, oh and um, Lots of regional yeah. meetings trying to oh. do the same stuff. And someone says, oh, it's a lot no, of we don't do that. We have different equipment and we don't have that. And we yeah. Do yeah. It's great. And again, you you learn so much nationally. Don't yeah. you? Like, and I do it when I visit different services and, and, I, and I assess um, whole time firefighters for their apprenticeship stuff. And I see different things. And I'm like, actually, yeah that's a different way to do it and it's perfectly mm-hmm. safe and it's nothing yeah. like what we do yeah it's really interesting you know as much as I say that and people sort of go they sigh as if it's a <laughs> it sounds like terrible sounds boring but actually it's I, I really love it it's really interesting I it's it very um, interesting yeah, yeah really because you obviously you are comparing what other services do and you are reflecting on what your service does and sometimes this stuff is historic that we've done the same way forever mm. and actually I'm gonna pull it upside down and let's find out another way which is safer more efficient and actually um that's way true. more effective yeah so yeah. well um, you, you learn about like things like the exit project because that's been out for ages with with road traffic collisions and we had yeah, Tim yeah. Beam on the podcast speaking about rapid extrication and why yeah. we've been so focused on long drawn out rtc stabilization yeah, it's mad, yeah. it is mad and there's no evidence behind it as well it's no like, exactly it's like fear then, isn't it it's just i <laughs> know it's fear and you try and change that approach yeah. to it people are like what if we all of a sudden snap the C-spine? Well, the data suggests you're definitely not going to do that no. just by 
and yeah. slightly more movement in the vehicle. Yeah. But the time you will save and the increased in, in you know, survivability for that casualty by getting them straight to that primary care. Anyway, I digress down a rabbit hole. But the no, point no, it's, making is, yeah. it's like, you know, it's just the way it was done back then. And if we'd have known better, right we'd now. have done differently and we'd be in a whole different place now. But trying to turn that Titanic around is so it's fascinating. I, I really, like I really love it. And I think, again, it's, it's it, it, the uh, NOG has, has forced a new culture in the service to reflect and review what we've been doing for these years that, you know, it's, it's I think the fire services historically are quite, this is the way we've done it for a while <laughs> oh. <laughs> and that we don't want to change. Um, however, change is is good it's, it's changes there and it should only be implemented for good um so i've i think nog has forced us to do that and i've i've i'm enjoying being part of that and that sort of looking reflecting um let's have a little look and and get the buy-in and make sure that the the crews are on board and have their say because like i say they're there doing it you know um like what do you think and we've got yeah, so and you don't many want to specialists. discourage their own their own judgment yeah, because exactly, they are the subject yeah. of our experts they're right they're Absolutely. at the coalface they're at the tip of the sword and that's what i love so much about guidance when people say oh it's yeah. guidance and they go yeah but what do i have to do well you don't yeah. have to do anything i mean there's some recognized procedures it's guidance yeah but it's guidance. so you're it's not you're defining a smart it. person you're a subject matter expert you're you know what you're doing yeah how do you want to apply this to your tactical plan and that yeah, petrifies exactly. some people because we've done 40 years of you must do it like this no matter what. Yeah. And you've yeah. seen it so many times, I'm sure. Someone doing something yeah, this fear, illogical because yeah. they're scared to death of being told they're doing it wrong. And you go, mate, why Why yeah. have you chosen that ladder? Or why have you chosen that procedure? Yeah. Like, well, I was always told in training school, uh, I have to use the X. Yeah. And you're like, yes, but you're a competent firefighter now. Does this look like it makes yeah. sense? Yeah, yeah exactly. like, Well, no, but I don't want, you know, what if someone just use you use you not. yeah are they going to be okay is the, yeah. the senior manager going to be okay when they see me do this look that's, i'm telling you about use... culture again doesn't it you know, that, that fear. Yeah. yeah absolutely so um yeah so i'm also an instructor i'm still in i'm still a ba instructor rtc instructor so oh, i nice. do a lot down yeah i've kept my hand in that because i just love it and I'm, and again you know remember where you've come from but also like i don't want to lose that because that, i i just love it course. yeah Teaching i loved it as well yeah, so when I go down the college, I do some instructing down in the college. Um, on the Women and Fire Service weekend, I usually do the um, instant ground um, instructing and the BA That's instructing. That's came across my radar. Yes, yeah. <laughs> so I'm always the there doing that. Like, oh, you need to speak to Amy. She's amazing. <laughs> oh, I don't know. They're too kind. But I um, I, ge- I genuinely just love it. I, I love coming in contact. Those those weekends are amazing. And, and any time I go down the college, because you you watch new procedures you watch other people do something the way they do it in their service and it just blows my mind every time I sort of think it's just incredible the way we all do something we all do the same job and yet we all do it so differently and yet all meet the same objective it's just uh, amazing to really sort of have a job now in my day job that I'm actually looking into this stuff and still keeping my my finger on the pulse where I can with regards to instructing um which is you know teaching is a passion I love it I really enjoy that side of it um but no, that's um that's my job now, and obviously I'm still operational, so I still turn out to incidents. I'm still out there, um, and again, it's just I, I try I try and approach that with a bit of a coaching mentor um um yeah side of things rather than um. I'm Cause responsible because think... I'm the most senior person on the fire ground, but I haven't got yeah. to make all the decisions. You know, exactly. I'm just here yeah. to be a soft advice on your shoulder absolutely no, i'm not got i'm not here to tell you you're doing it wrong i'm not here to take charge unless something really goes like a brain fart yeah yeah but yeah. Um, you know yeah i trust you you can see it in the eyes that, can't you you can, yeah you can see it again it's that emotional intelligence i can see it in the eyes of the person i'm walking up to to see to get an update as to what's going on in the incident it can read that person even if i don't know that person you can read that read the person and see how are they holding that position yeah. as instant commander have they got this do they look confident are they just nervous in their in themselves or are they is this out of their capabilities so it's really been able to understand that and then have those conversations which then doesn't appear as if you're you're yeah. threatening or patronizing you are oh, there yeah, to support yeah. and help develop because if they my don't quickest way in do they want validation do yeah. they want guidance yeah. do they want support do they want me to praise them and go wow yeah. you know you're, James, doing a great job. you're a, you're yeah. a 40 year firefighter wow i love what you're doing there mate yeah yeah talk yeah. to me about your thoughts yeah. or do they want to go hey you know sally How's it going? It looks like you've really got control over it. How are you getting? And she's nervous as yeah. hell. 
you know, yeah. and you're like, nah, this is great. What's your thought? I love, I love, no, I love what you've yeah, done. Yeah, yeah, exactly. What, what's the what do you think is going to happen in the next 30 minutes? Who have we got on route? What's your thoughts? Yeah. And, uh, and you can change that person. Yeah, You'll change absolutely. that person for, for, you know, for, you could change them like, you know, period in regards to if you're given a little bit of that self praise that somebody who's a little bit nervous about, the position could be that they're new in the role or they've got station managers are terrible at that they don't get the context they have a quick 360 they see one thing and come straight up and go i need you to explain to me why a firefighter in sector three is doing this and you're like whoa fucking slow down yeah slow down yeah seek to understand you're attacking already what's going on Yeah. yeah yeah and then maybe i can give you the logic behind the one thing you've just observed yeah, absolutely. I remember when I was when I was a watch manager, and I, I imagine most people do this, but um, I remember having some firefighters and uh, firefighter ICs, um, and they were sort of on the path to becoming crew managers. And I regularly used to sit sit in the back as number five and let them take the truck. Um, first yeah. of all, let them sh- shadow me first. Let's watch. Go with me. Sticking with me this whole job, and then we slowly the transition moving back. That now you're going to sit in the front for this job, and I'm sitting in the back. I'm your shadow now. So go for it. Um, and that transition of building confidence in an individual, the knowledge and the skill is something they can sit and read and learn that. But it's the confidence of making the dis- difficult decisions um, that they sometimes they need the reinforcement of somebody like a rank, a senior rank to just give them a pat on the shoulder and say, that's brilliant. You've done a really good job. You got this. This is really yeah. good. Obviously, don't um, you want to make sure people own mistakes as well and not to be afraid yeah. of failing, which is I think is something that in that you don't again, want to culture. false confidence yeah but not false confidence watching, just because yeah. it's not exactly how you would do it i always say to people don't let perfect be the enemy of good Absolutely, you know were they yeah. safe were they yeah. competent yeah. okay good is the development areas 100 percent. of course there yeah. is what, not, like, there's not for me every yeah. single job yeah. <laughs> you know what i mean i'm should just be. at a different hopefully be. i'm just making less errors and yeah. less big ones you yeah. know don't be afraid of failure. I think that's a for any any position firefighter to chief is that we're human and um we do, we don't get it right every time. We do, we do make mistakes, but I think the culture surrounding failure um, and making a mistake needs to be a, in, a, in a bit more of a positive way. Um, if we've made a mistake and something's gone wrong, well, then there we are. We've got a development. Um, let's work on making sure that doesn't happen again. It might be something that actually uh, everybody's making that mistake. So maybe something needs Definitely. to change in the procedure that we're doing. Um so, yeah, and, and that's I think kind that, of what the whole point of the podcast was because people are having yeah. these conversations anyway. I'm like, let's stop yeah. pretending we're yeah. all glistening, infallible professionals. Yeah, exactly. we're bloody well not. And I'm not saying yeah. to scare the public because none of us know what we're doing. Of course we do. But humans, we yeah. should be the eternal students. None of one's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. And things change. You know, di- technologies are changing. Things we were presented with with um, with a scenario or an incident that we, we haven't planned for this. We don't oh, know God, what we're yeah. going to be presented with. When we and look actually... back at some of the stuff around electric vehicles are also toxic. Oh my gosh, yeah. We will just bury our heads in the sand and go, yeah. what are we doing? Exactly. I know it's scary when we look into even things like wildfire. How have we yeah. got to where we have now without mm-hmm. losing firefighters? I just, you know, it's just, it, we are human and we're learning. And I think that openness to learning, openness to acceptance of, um, failure that's that's okay um just it's how you then take that and react to that is the is the thing i'm more looking at and more considered um so First yeah to learning is acknowledging you don't know it absolutely yeah absolutely um but yeah so i think it's, it's important you know we do that with our we've got our kids i think it starts early on that doesn't it i was having a conversation with my daughter last night and this gcse results this week um and she was in tears i mean she hasn't even had results she's in tears already um oh. And I think it's teaching our kids and teaching the, you know, new starters, firefighters who come into the service that failure is inevitable and it actually mm-hmm. only produces mm-hmm. it produces growth. So let's just embrace that. And I said to my daughter, hey, I, I, I communicate those things to my kids all the time. Like, oh, yeah. It took me 21 promotion processes to get three jobs. Yeah, yeah. You know, to get to the level, yeah, that, well, probably is. five jobs in total, but only three actual promotions. Yeah. So yeah. when I miss those ones, like I would talk to my daughter about it. I'd be like, oh, daddy's got an interview process on uh, yeah. Friday. Because we asked them to do scary, Definitely. scary stuff all yeah. the damn time. Go to the brand new club, move into the new school, yeah. do your exams. It's yeah. petrifying stuff. So when I've got yeah. something that I'm, um, and then when I don't get it, you know, I said yeah. to my daughter, you know, daddy didn't get that one. And she would get so upset, you know, oh. she'd be like, oh why don't they like you daddy you know Uh, i'm like baby it's nothing to do with that you know someone else was also working hard to get the job 
for themselves and for their family and for yeah. all the things that they want to do with that. They're not against you. They're just no, for themselves. Personal. And I don't yeah. mean like they're for themselves, like they're only thinking of themselves. They're thinking of their life and their family and their career. And yeah. look, that's the way the cookie crumbles. Yeah, but isn't that interesting if your daughter that says that? that. Yeah, your yeah. daughter says that, did they not like you? Well, then if she ever fails at anything, she's going to think it's a personal attack. It's exactly. her. her. The so you've that. got to tell them yeah. that you have your own failures. Absolutely. You need to own that. Yeah, it alone. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I do say with my kids, and I know I'm my own worst enemy for, you know, I I'm, give myself a real hard time if I fail at something or, or I haven't met that, met that perfect standard that I sort of set myself. But I'm really try and remain really aware of how my children read that for me so try and just try and consider those things when you when you are talking about work around your children Mm. um that it's okay to fail it's it's okay I mean I don't even like the word fail but you know it is what it is let's try and make it a more positive thing it's not this time it's just not going to happen this time we'll go again it's fine I've got win or learn tattooed on the side of my ribs yeah <laughs> yeah like, learn yeah one of the many corny tattoos I've got all over my body <laughs> <laughs> but, um... well I've got a tattoo on my arm of strength is beauty and I think um that resonates with me that regardless of what um life throws at you and however wh- whatever your path may become it's okay to not be strong but you, you, what's inside you and the strength that sort of your golden thread is what makes you beautiful so try not to be hard on yourselves just stay authentic be you and then that that is that is all you can ever be absolutely love that we we have literally spoken for like an hour and 40 minutes straight no oh stop. my gosh no one's gonna listen <laughs> to this no <laughs> I absolutely love that. I really love that. Is there any closing points before we sort of wrap it up that you think? Because I I'll be total transparency to the audience. I have a little list of bits that I'd love for us to discuss. And I feel like we've we've covered a uh-huh. wonderful landscape in, in yeah. our discussion there. Is there any final thoughts or anything you would you would like to leave us with um before we kind of wrap it up? I think just to wrap it up, I would say, regardless of your position in whichever organization you work for, um, you will only ever be successful if you are in that role as you, as authentic you with the hat that fits you for that job. Um, if the hat doesn't fit and it's feeling wobbly, well then just reflect, have a take some time, make sure you ground yourself and um, remind yourself why you are there and what difference you're there to make. Um, but be fair to yourself, take some time out as well. Um, we you are all have human. That time out. I always think you'd have tactical yeah. pauses because you can't see the tactical picture when pause. you're in the frame absolutely you know, you've got to step back and look at it and say is this me yeah there's something yeah. in viscerally my gut feel is there's something yeah. that ain't me here know your safe space like i mentioned from all my life like as a child up to now have a safe space have a place where you can just go and be you where i can just go and be amy i'm not a mother i'm not a station manager i'm not a rugby player i'm no one i can just go and just be me and, and for me actually it's a rugby pitch but I can go on that pitch and just be me and just let out what I need to be. Um, so have a safe space. If you haven't, you're probably going to burn out. So um, make sure you find it. Yeah. I love that. Thanks, Pete. Thank you so, so, so much for your generosity with your time and your honesty and your transparency. And I suppose your, your authenticity today. I really appreciate it. Uh, thanks, Pete. I've really enjoyed it too. The Firefighters Podcast was created to recognize, acknowledge, inspire, and hopefully even motivate these incredible individuals who have chosen to be part of the first responder community. Our driving purpose is to create a legacy resource for the current and future generations of firefighters and first responders. We get some incredible feedback from listeners and guests. And as the podcast grows, our desire to create longevity and sustainability means that we are asking for the support of our listeners. If you want to support the podcast, if you want to get discounts to our merchandise, hoodies, clothing, coins, patches, tablets, and also access to all of the incredible documents get shared with us from our podcast guests and sector leaders and please head over to our patreon page and for just three pound a month you can support the future of the podcast please finally hit that follow subscribe or rate button on the platform you're listening and wherever you're in the world please support your emergency services responders and thank you for listening